and welcome to episode number 17 of CS350 Online. I'm your host, Leslie, and in today's episode, we're going to start talking about devices and I.O., which is a key part of your computer that we've completely ignored up until now. But first, of course, we have the OS of the day. Now, what is our OS of the day? So today's OS is one that some of you, I think, are probably familiar with. And while many of you may not have actually used this operating system, most certainly your parents have. And that operating system is DOS, which stands for Disk Operating System. Now, DOS is an operating system that's been around since 1981, and it was actually a collaboration between Microsoft and IBM. Now, what happened was... In 1981, I believe it was like January 17th of 1981, IBM released their very first personal computer. And uh, they needed an operating system to be released with this computer. And my understanding was that uh, IBM was actually working on their own operating system, but unfortunately it wasn't ready yet. And uh, the operating system, I believe, was called CPM. And the problem with CPM is, as I said, it wasn't ready. So IBM, and it wasn't going to be ready in time for the launch, so IBM had to go out and they had to find somebody else that could actually make an operating system or acquire an operating system for them so that they could, you know, release their hardware on time. So they approached Microsoft, and Microsoft approached a company called Seattle Computer Products, and they purchased DOS from them, and then they made some modifications to it to create DOS. Now, what's interesting is there are so many variations of DOS, especially in the early 80s. So I actually had a 1981 IBM PC. It's the Model 5150. Now, I didn't have it in the early 80s. I actually had it in the mid-90s, and that's a long story for another day. But when I got it, it came with like probably 50 or 60 floppy disks. And among them was like six different versions of DOS. And I, I knew what DOS was, but I didn't know the, what the difference between double DOS and PC DOS was. And yet there was this thing called double DOS. And then there was Dr. DOS and Microsoft DOS and 86 DOS. There's all these different variations on the DOS operating system. At the end of the day, the only one I actually ended up using was PC-DOS, which was the specific variant that was actually released from IBM. Now, I did have Microsoft DOS as well, but I refused to use it. So what is DOS? Well, if any of you have ever actually used it, you know it's a very basic command line uh, style operating system. And it offers no multitasking, so it doesn't have any kind of concurrency support. It has no GUI, so no desktop and point and click environment. And it's actually very restricted in other ways as well. So you're looking at a very basic file system, and in which case uh, the old versions of DOS, they only supported something called the FAT file system. Uh, and uh, the FAT file system is very, very simple to understand, and we will be talking about it briefly in the next part of the course, but we're not going to talk about it now. But the FAT file system is very easy to understand, but it also has a lot of restrictions. And in particular, one of the restrictions that DOS had was that the file names had to be eight characters or less with a three character or less extension. So if you were trying to download something off BitTorrent, you know it's got like a 500 character weird name because everybody who's done anything to that particular torrent file has added their handle to the file name. Um, <laughs> well, that wouldn't be supported in a DOS operating system. So, and, and it, the limitations extend beyond just the file names. Uh, it also goes into limited support for memory, and that actually comes from two different things. So the FAT file system is very restrictive in how big your files can be. Uh, so FAT16, I want to say, had like a 65 meg file limit, but I don't remember because that was a really long time ago that I used FAT16. Uh, FAT32, however, which is still quite popular even today, has a four gigabyte uh, file size limit. And in fact, if you go to a store and you purchase a USB device, like a little USB key, and it's less than 64 gigs in size, the chances are it's formatted with FAT32. And that means that your files will be restricted to four gigs in size. 
Uh, aside from just like the file size, it was also the amount of physical memory that the operating supported system supported was actually really small as well. So early versions of DOS really only supported 16 bit addressing and they didn't even offer virtual memory at that time because really DOS was just like a mechanism for loading the program and doing some very basic file system management. So, I mean, you could do things like copy, move, but you couldn't do any of these sophisticated things that we do today with, with the system. Ooh. Excuse me. Another interesting thing about the early versions of DOS is they didn't actually separate kernel from user. So there was no concept of like kernel mode versus user mode. So things were obviously faster because you're not really dealing with system calls so much, but you also have direct hardware access, which meant that if you have an old DOS system, getting the right version of DOS that actually matches your computer was actually pretty important. It did, however, support a basic kind of batch script, which can be fun to play with. Now, many of you may have noticed that if you go on a Windows system, you can open up a terminal and you can start typing in it and it looks like DOS and it feels like DOS, but it's not DOS. And in fact, I think it was Windows 2000 and above don't offer true DOS. It's like a DOS emulator now in a much more powerful shell environment, which I think Microsoft calls PowerShell. I don't remember. Uh, but everything before that, that was consumers like Windows 3.1, Windows 95, Windows 98, those were all DOS-based operating systems, so they were extensions to DOS. And so they actually, if you open up a command terminal, that was DOS, but it isn't anymore. And if you're really bored and want to relive maybe parts of your childhood, uh, for me anyways, you can go to this uh, website called DOSBox and you can actually get like a little emulator for DOS. One of the problems is if you try to install like an old DOS game on a modern computer, it will run way too fast because of the clock speeds and things. So you have to get this like DOSBox emulator and that will actually make sure things are running at the correct speed. And then there's all sorts of these websites like Abandonia that you can go to and find pretty much every DOS game you could ever want. And I mean, if you've never played any old 80s or 90s DOS games, one that I can certainly recommend, and it's one of the oldest ones, is Castle Adventure. This one was released in 84. I played a lot of this one when I was younger. Uh, of course you can't zoom in here, um, but Castle Adventure is kind of this extended ASCII based game where you've got to explore a castle and find all the treasures and then escape and it's kind of fun and there's monsters to fight and things like that. Classic old game. And, um, and then of course if maybe that's not your thing, you've got the old Sierra games, there's the King's Quest games. And uh, if you like to get really, really sick in about 30 seconds, Wolfenstein 3D is super, super classic early 90s game. Lots of fun, but super nauseating. <laughs> I can never play it for more than five minutes. And then of course there's like Doom and Duke Nukem and all those other wonderful games that you can play. And they're all like old DOS games and they're lots and lots of fun. So there you go. There's my spiel on DOS. All right, so there's not much to recap from last day because to be honest, we actually finished the total topic. If for those of you who are just tuning in though, the last class we actually talked about scheduling. So we talked about um, some of the different scheduling algorithms that were out there uh, and some of the goals that we had. For example, we want our schedule of course to be very efficient. We also want our scheduler to not starve threads because if a scheduler is going to starve threads, then you end up with that situation that I mentioned where uh, some jobs were started in 1967 and in like 1973 when the system was shut down, they found some jobs that had never run. And you don't want that to happen because how do you know that those jobs weren't important to somebody's resource? So starvation is a really bad thing, so we're always trying to prevent starvation. At the same time, we're also trying to handle things like priority. Some threads, such as a video game, will have much more priority or should have more priority than something like BitTorrent. 
So uh, we need to make sure that our scheduling algorithm has some way of indicating the priority of a thread or determining the priority of a thread automatically. And then we also want to make sure that our scheduling algorithm can handle things like threads that yield and threads that are asleep and then wake up. Do we handle them immediately or do we let them just join the back of the line? So we looked at a bunch of algorithms there and then we finished up talking about multi-core scheduling and we showed you two different approaches to that. So we'll have the quiz up on Learn for that section shortly. And please do be patient as we get the remaining quizzes up. All right. So today we're actually going to start a new topic. Yay. That didn't sound very enthusiastic. I should clarify, this is probably one of my most favorite sections of the course. So, um, we've talked about a lot of different parts of the operating system. We've talked about mostly looking at the application and the implementation view of the operating system. We've looked at how do you implement concurrency and we've looked at that from the perspective of time sharing and preemption. And we've also looked at things like um, how do we abstract the user programs and the hardware from, well, not so much the hardware. How do we abstract the user programs from the kernel and from each other? So we've looked at things like virtual memory and system calls. And it's really important you remember that kind of stuff because if you decide to take things like distributed systems in fourth year, system calls are going to come back into the discussion. So make sure you remember how they work. Um, so we've talked about the concurrency. We've talked about the threading and the synchronization. We've talked about processes, we've talked about system calls and abstraction, and we've spent a lot of time talking about virtual memory as part of that abstraction and the role it plays with isolation. And we've also talked about scheduling, so how we choose which thread to go next. But one of the things that we haven't even thought of mentioning is how do you actually interact with all the devices on your computer? So if you were to take a look at your desktop, and I want to like, free my my camera here but I'm afraid I won't get it back in the right spot let's see this so if you were to look at your desktop now I'm gonna try to turn my camera head here you can see everybody's desktop has a large number of things on it so you've got um, Aside from all kinds of junk, we've got a laptop. You know I've got this microphone here. You can see I've got this giant ultra-wide screen. Um, I've got a tablet. And then, of course, I also have, you know, a Wacom device here. I'm going to lock my camera back into place. There we go. So... <laughs> so many screens and you know it looks like four screens doesn't it but that one that you saw two windows open is actually just one it's a 38 inch ultra wide LG HDR screen and yes that is a tablet and a laptop and no this is not all of my computers <laughs> so looks like I got my camera in the wrong spot here uh, <laughs> I like computers, okay? Did you honestly think I wasn't gonna have like 500 of them in my house? <laughs> it doesn't matter. If you look at your desktop, you've got a bunch of devices on it. I mean, I have my giant external screen. I've got this device here. There's the microphone, there's the camera. I've got an external mouse plugged in. All of these things. <laughs> Comment on Twitch here. If you have eight screens in your house, I want to know where you live so I can have eight screens too. <laughs> I'm not telling you where I live. 
you know, studies say that, um, or at least my understanding of the studies is that dual screen setups are actually significantly more productive than a single screen. So I just kind of took it to the extreme and got one really, really, really wide screen. And behind me, attached to my, um, my research machine, there's two 4K monitors on that one. And yeah, there's computers everywhere you look at my house, okay? <laughs> Anyways, back to devices. It doesn't matter what computer you sit in front of, there's all kinds of devices attached to it. And some of the devices you may not even be thinking of because they're physically a part of it. So for example, my MacBook has a keyboard in it and a touchpad, and those are actual devices. They're just packed all in the same package. They're not external devices. And then of course there's things like printers. So I've actually got like a hole drilled in the floor over here by my wall, and I've got a whole bunch of cables running down my desktop's too noisy, so I keep um, it in my nice, cool basement so I don't have to listen to it. But my printer's down there as well. And so are all my, my NASes and my routers and my switches. And don't ask. Uh, <laughs> they're, all, they're all down in my server room. But those are all external devices. And then what's interesting is there's also a bunch of devices on your computer that are internal that we don't think of actually being a device and yet they are. Things like your disk drive, that is a device. So my Mac of course has a lovely SSD inside. This, um, which you saw here on the pan, I've got a little Surface 3 here. It also has an SSD in it. That is a device. And then there are things that we don't even think about because I think some of you might be like yeah hard drives a device what about the clock every computer has a clock and I mean when I used to build desktops eons ago like in the 90s when you had a clock you knew it existed because you actually had to plug this external speaker into it to make your computer beep and do all these annoying things um, but that clock that is responsible for firing the interrupt to do preemption, that in itself is also a device. And things for doing character input and output, things like your network interfaces so that we can send data out and receive data, those are all devices. So there's all kinds of different devices. There's external devices, there's internal devices. Devices can be purely for input. So for example, something like my mouse is purely an input device. And the same with my keyboard. My giant uh, ultra wide monitor here is not a touch screen, so it's purely an output device. And then there are some devices which are input output. So if you've got one of these newer MacBook Pros, they've got this little touch bar across the top, little LCD panel that's both input and output. It's output because it's showing you things and it's input because it's also a touch that you can use to interact with your computer. So there's all different kinds of devices and many of these devices are actually critical to the behavior of your computer, such as the clock. We can't have time sharing if we don't have a clock device. So then this question starts to become, okay, so if devices are so important, for example, a clock device is required for actually doing something like preemption and time sharing concurrency, and keyboards are important, of course, for user interaction, how does the kernel of the operating system actually interact with those physical devices? How do we actually do that? How do we tell them to do something? How do we learn what they've been doing? And how, how do we actually make sure that they're behaving properly? So that's what we're going to talk about in this section. Now, if I seem overly enthusiastic about devices, uh, please understand that there is a reason. It's not just because I'm a crazy computer lady instead of, you know, a crazy cat lady. Um, it's because I actually used to write drivers for printers. <laughs> so one of my co-op jobs eons ago was actually writing printer drivers. And I have... Um, I worked for Epson, the printer company, uh, and while a lot I worked there for a very long time, I didn't always do work on printer drivers. I did a lot of other research-based stuff as well, 
but I did write maybe four or five different printer drivers and that's things for like impact printers. So you know your old nine pin and 24 pin printers, but I also wrote uh, Linux drivers for um, POS devices, which funny story, when I, I showed up, I think it was my second term there and I'm sitting down at my desk and I realized I'd been put on the hardware side of the fence and uh, I got plopped onto my desk, a pile of circuit boards. And I kind of look up at my boss and I'm like, do you realize I'm in CS? <laughs> Cause it's like, why are you giving me this like heap of circuit boards? What am I supposed to do with it? Now don't get me wrong. I love hardware and, but I, I don't have a lot of experience like yeah. actually like soldering. In fact, I suck at soldering. Um, so I wasn't really sure why they had dumped this heap of boards on my desk, but it was the POS device that I had to first assemble before I wrote the driver. And for probably about a year, I didn't know what POS meant. So because of how they behaved, I always considered them to be POS meant, oh, this is just a cutesy internal name they use to refer to the device as, you know, piece of shit device. It's not. POS device means point of sale. It's like the receipt printers uh, in a store. So yeah, but the, I mean, it was funny at the time. <laughs> so we are now going to talk about how to interact with those devices. And if I seem overly excited, it's because I actually have some real world experience writing device drivers. Got some experience from it at uh, Google as well, working with uh, hardware in this way too. So first off, if you don't remember CS251 that well, and I certainly understand because, you know, two seconds after the exam is over, you forget everything. Uh, but a few terms that we might be throwing around just to keep yourself familiar. A bus is not the yellow thing that you went to school on, but in some ways it's kind of similar because a bus in a computer is just essentially a path which permits uh, devices to talk to each other. So it's, it's a communication path. And what's interesting is that um, when you put data onto a bus, every device that is attached to that bus will receive that data. So it's kind of an interesting thing. The internal bus or the main bus or the memory bus or the front side bus, those, that particular bus is probably the most important one in your computer and it goes by many names. It's the actual communication path between the CPU and RAM. And it's obviously the most important one because if you look at any sequence of instructions, we're gonna have to load each instruction from memory. So we need the CPU to actually be on a very short, very fast path to RAM. So that's the internal main memory, front side bus, whatever you wanna call it. And then there is the peripheral bus which is the bus that, uh, or expansion bus, that's where all of the devices are going to be. And what's interesting is uh, there's also ways for the peripherals to be connected to the main bus so that they can access memory as well. So how these are laid out really, really depends on the hardware you have. And then a bridge is what actually connects two different buses together. And what does this actually look like? It looks like a bunch of wires. Or if you have like a motherboard, you can look at your motherboard under a, a, a light and you might be able to see the paths uh, on it. When I got my first 486 that actually worked, um, I got it used and the previous owner had like taken a bunch of wires and like actually soldered them on to like reroute things. I mean, it still worked, but it was really weird. All right, so let's talk about the devices for a minute. If we wanna tell our CPU to do something like add two things, what we do is we load the values we want to be added into some registers and then we issue an instruction to say, add the values in these two registers. So how do we actually tell a physical device to do something? Well, what's interesting is that the devices themselves actually have their own registers and their own bit of computation power. So something even like this little device here, it's a little Wacom tablet, this actually has a little bit of power of its own so that it can do what it needs to do. And the same with your keyboard and pretty much anything else. You have a little tiny bit of processing power on board to do whatever tasks that you need to do. 
And so in order to communicate with the device and actually get it to do what you want it to do, you need, just like on a CPU, you're going to need some registers that you can interact with. Now, to segregate these from the registers on the CPU, we call the registers that actually physically live on our hardware, we call them device registers. Now, there are three primary types of device registers, and they have different purposes. So the first is the status register. And a status register, you're typically going to be reading the value in it because it's going to tell you something about what the device is doing. So for example, on a clock device, there might be a status register that indicates what time is it. So you read that register to figure out what time is it. And then we have a command register, which is typically a register you would write to and the act of writing to that register would tell the device, do something. And what you write to the command register would tell it what to do. Like maybe if you write a one to the command register, a red light goes off. Maybe if you write a two to your command register, a green light goes off. My, my research computer, my big server, uh, actually, because it had, I wanted a really good RAM, and a really good processor and a really good graphics card. They tend to be the gaming equipment that I put in, gaming components. And so my RAN is, even though I don't have a window on my case, my RAN it has rainbow LEDs on it, which you can actually play with. So I could actually issue a command to change the color of the lights on my RAM. My kids love it. All right. Then we have a third kind of register called the data register. Now the data register tends to be a bit bigger and um, this is actually used to trans, so this is read and written because it's used to transfer data to and from the device. So for example, if I want to write some data to my hard drive, I'm going to write a chunk of data to the data register and that will cause that to be written to the disk and then if I read from the data register after issuing an appropriate command, I would be getting data from the device. Now what's interesting is to save space, they've actually combined a lot of these registers together. So you'll see typically a status and command register where you read to get the status and you write to issue a command. And I've also seen command and data as well. So that's kind of a, a quirk of device registers. Now remember, these are on the device. Okay. Whoopsies. So what I want to show you now is, well, the specification for the clock device in OS 161. So in order to actually create, to interact with one of your devices, you need some specifications to know which device registers it has what you need to read from in order to figure out what the device is doing. You need to know what registers to write to so that you can issue the appropriate commands and so on and so forth. Now the spec for our clock is very, very small. There would be some, of course, text to, to accompany this. We don't have it here, uh, but it would be in the MIPS R3000 uh, specification guide. And I've actually worked through a real spec before. So eons ago, I was doing some work to take a look at essentially build pretty print, which is actually the name of the tool I was working on at Google that is actually supposed to go through your hardware and print off the values of every single device register, every field, everything. So that if you've got two identical systems, but one of them is flashing a green light and the other one isn't, you can get these hardware trees, these representations and do a dip on them and figure out what is the difference between these two? Why is this green light flashing on one and not the other? So I've actually worked with specs before. They're not usually this small. I can tell you the NVIDIA spec looks about this thick. It's a great big monster. But we're lucky because we're just dealing with this silly little clock here. And this silly little clock only has six device registers to worry about. So let's talk about them. So the first two are kind of obvious. They are status registers and they detect, they tell you what the current time is in seconds and nanoseconds. Now you might be wondering, well, how are they doing that? So we're not saying today is December 
whatever and well, I know it's not December okay it's November 10th and it is uh it says 10 4 a.m no that's not how they tell you the time what they do to tell you the time is they're actually telling you how many seconds or nanoseconds have elapsed since the epoch and the epoch for most devices is um January 1st, 1970, at midnight, UTC. So that's the epoch. So it's how many seconds have elapsed since that epoch. And then from there, you can compute which day it is and so on and so forth. Now, what's interesting about this is you'll see here, I'm not going to talk about offset today. We will talk, well, we might talk about offset today. Uh, but just not right now. We're going to ignore the offset for right now. We're going to talk about size. Size is the number of bytes that that device register is using. So the current time, which is registered <clears throat> as seconds from the epoch, is in a four byte register. Now you might imagine we might have a little tiny problem here. The tiny problem here is at some point we're going to overflow this register. And you might be thinking, it's not going to happen in my lifetime, so why should I worry about it? It is going to happen in your lifetime. It's going to happen in my lifetime. In fact, it's going to happen in less than 18 years. On January 19th, 2038, at 31407 GMT, we will overflow that register. It is known as the end of Unix time. And there will be parties, I'm sure. Okay, maybe there are like bunker parties or something. I don't know. But we've got 18 years to deal with it. So it is going to, at some point, overflow it. So what are some ways that we could actually handle it? Well, we could set that to be the new epoch. That would work. Uh, or we could just start oh, excuse me, building devices that have more bytes assigned to this. There's lots of different solutions. Now, some of you might be thinking this sounds an awful lot similar to the Y2K bug. And some of you might be like, I don't remember what that was. Well, I can tell you what Y2K was. So in older computer systems, like from the 80s and 90s, instead of storing the year as four digits, they stored the year as two digits. So they just stored the last two digits. And the problem is, that what is year zero zero was that 1900 or would it be interpreted as 2000 and it really depended on your software how the year zero zero was was interpreted as and it was the belief that that would throw airplanes would fall from the sky and banks would blow up and all kinds of crazy stuff none of this crazy stuff actually happened but um yeah fun story all right so we will come to the end of Unix time in the next 18 years. So we've got 18, we know it's coming and we've got lots and lots of time to solve that problem. Then I'm going to skip this register here and we're going to talk about countdown time. So the countdown time register, if you write to the countdown time and you would write a time in microseconds, it is going to initiate a countdown on the clock. So if you wanted to start a countdown so that you get preemption after, you know, 10 microseconds, then you would write to the countdown time register, 10, and it would start a countdown. And then when the count has completed, the clock device will throw an interrupt and it will be marked in this status and command register here called interrupt to indicate, hey, the countdown has completed. So this is, and once we've indicated that the countdown has completed, we may also want to, you know, tell the device, yes, device, good job. I see that you've completed your countdown. Okay, let's move on. So we sometimes we want to clear the interrupts or acknowledge to the device that we've seen that it's completed its task. So we will then want to write back to this register or read from it to clear that out. So a question on um, 
switch here. If an internal bus connects CPU and RAM, does that mean RAM also counts as a device? Yes, in a way. Um, so it's, it is a device, but how we use that device is a little bit different than how we interact with something like the clock. So we don't need a, like a specific device driver to interact with RAM because it's kind of handled by the MMU. But we do need to do the management of that RAM in the kernel through the core map. So it's kind of, it, it, it is a device, but it's kind of a weird device. Okay. So we have the ability to, on the clock to issue a countdown and when the countdown expires, it's going to fire an interrupt and we can acknowledge back to the device that yes, we've seen it go about your business again. There's another command register called restart on expired. So one of the problems is, is you could manually every time the interrupt fires to indicate that the countdown has expired, you could manually restart a countdown. So, okay, it's expired. Interrupt fires. Okay, I'm going to reissue a command to do a brand new countdown. But that's actually a little bit costly, and you might be slowing the device down a little bit because you've got to, you know, handle the interrupt before the countdown starts all over again. So you've got this period of time while you're handling the interrupt. We don't want that. So for something like preemption, we just want to set a countdown, and when the countdown expires, the interrupt still fires, but I want the device to almost immediately start another countdown automatically. I don't want to have to reissue the countdown. So what's going to happen is if you write to restart on expiry, when the countdown completes, the clock will automatically start a new countdown. Hence, you can implement things like time sharing and preemption. Uh, because we can say, okay, clock, every 10 milliseconds, I want you to fire an interrupt. And the clock will just do it forever. And you don't have to interact with the clock after that. Because it will just keep doing its job. It will keep doing its job. The final register that we have is probably one that seems a little silly. And that is the command register for the speaker. So a lot of clocks were traditionally actually attached to a little analog crappy speaker. And uh, when you booted your computer, your old desktop, the computer would beep. And sometimes the course of beeps would indicate whether or not there was a problem. Um, and I know Macs actually, they still use an auditory uh, mechanism for knowing if there's something wrong with the motherboard. A lot of the PC manufacturers actually decided against using the auditory way and they actually started to use um, blinking LEDs or LED combinations. And I know my research machine downstairs actually has an, a little LCD panel which posts an error code. And I know this because it was down for a few months due to a problem with the main bus. Or not the main bus, the peripheral bus had a problem. It's fixed now. So we can use things like the speaker to issue like a beep code to indicate there's a problem. You could use it, uh, for example, if you hit backspace too many times at like a bash prompt and your computer beeps, that used to be the clock beeping. It's very weird or you can use it to set like um, an alarm or something. So if you write to the speaker register, it would cause the clock to beep. It's also a really good way to annoy all your friends and family. All right, so that's our clock device. Let's look at some other devices. So what if I want to have the ability to read and write characters from a serial console? So this device is actually much more simple. There are actually only three registers, but there's some interesting behavior. So some of the interesting behavior with this device is the fact that we need some synchronization with it. So here's the thing. So our three registers, we have a command and data register known as the character buffer. If we want to write data to the character buffer, i.e. we want to put data out onto the serial console, then we are going to write 
to the character buffer and that's going to cause it to go out to the serial console. If we want to get input from the serial console, then we would be reading from the character buffer. Now, what's going to happen here? Ugh. Tired. <laughs> so what happens when you stay up, you know, past two in the morning answering Piazza posts and uh, writing code? So we've got a write IRQ register and a read IRQ. Remember that IRQ is actually a short form for interrupt, and I don't know why it's the short form for interrupt, it just is. So what's, these are both status registers, and what's going to happen is if there is a write in progress, so if the serial console is in the act of writing the character buffer to the serial console, then the write IRQ status register will indicate that a write is in progress. When the write is complete, a different value will go into the write IRQ to indicate the write has completed. And if there's an error code, it will place an error code into that particular register for the operating system to read. Similarly, if we are have a read in progress, then the read IRQ will have a value in it indicating the read is in progress. And then when the read is done. Now, of course, when the reader write has completed, the device will still throw an interrupt. So that's always fun. Now I said you need some synchronization for this. If there is a write already in progress, that means that the character buffer is being written out to the serial console. So if you then start writing to the character buffer before that previous write has completed, what is going to happen? And the answer is undefined. This is actually something from the hardware manufacturers. You'll actually see this in their specifications, where if you try to write at the same time, uh, so if you're trying to, to actually like write um, twice, like have two writes go on at the same time, they'll tell you the behavior is undefined. What undefined means is anything could happen. And the hardware manufacturer isn't saying the device will fail in this way. The hardware manufacturer by saying undefined is we don't know what's going to happen. Anything could happen. Your computer might sprout legs and run away from you, which isn't what I'm pretty sure my computers want to do for me half the time. Uh, question on Twitch, what is the serial console? So you can think of it as kind of like an old fashioned input output system, like an old fashioned shell kind of. So the, that's kind of the ability to um, type characters and have them actually sh um, be received by, by the computer and likewise show them back onto a console device. Um, it's a very old idea. <laughs> so if the two R writes are happening at the same time, our device says this behavior is undefined. And so we, when we are making the software to write to the serial console, to actually write to these device registers, we need to do the synchronization. So we need to prevent multiple writes from happening at the same time. Okay. So how that, so these are the devices, these are the specs, and we're gonna look at more devices and more specs um, on Thursday, but just these two for today. I'm gonna keep things a little bit shorter today, I think, I think, unless I get rambling. So how do we actually then communicate in the kernel with the device? And the answer is with the device driver. And in fact, if you look at the percentage of code for something like Windows or the Linux kernel, the majority of the code is actually in device drivers. What a device driver is, is the device driver is a component, usually a loadable kernel component, that is capable of interacting with the device registers. So it knows which device registers to read and which device re registers to write from to do whatever task that you want it to do. So for example, let's suppose we wanted to write a device driver that is going to write to the serial console. Now we remember that we can only have one write going on at a time. So we're going to have a semaphore 
that is responsible for making sure that only right one right happens at a time. So it's actually going to be a binary semaphore. And so what we're going to do then is we are going to P our device right semaphore. And once we know that no other writes are happening, we can then write our characters to the data buffer. And then we need to wait for the write to complete before we release the thing. Because writing to that device data register, it's not instantaneously going to cause that data to be output to the serial console. So we need to wait because it's going to take time for the device to actually do what you want it to do. So we need to wait for the right IRQ register to indicate, of course, that the device, the right is done and you can move on. So we are going to repeat, we're going to spin and we are going to repeatedly read the right IRQ register until it indicates complete. And then we're going to acknowledge completion by clearing the right IRQ register. And then we VR semaphore. And there you go. This is how we are going to interact with our devices. So another question on Twitch is out of curiosity, why are they called device drivers? Um, I don't know. <laughs> I am going to make the assumption that they are called device drivers because they are they are communicating with physical devices in some sense. Whereas you can also have drivers that are for just doing software based tasks that don't actually interact with the hardware. I feel like most people just like if you grow, if you've grown up in the DOS or Windows side, you just call them drivers. But if you've grown up more on the Unix side of the world, you tend to call them device drivers. All right, so that's an example of a device driver. So communicating, the kernel would use this bit of code to communicate with the device. A few things first. So is the device driver a part of the kernel or not? Since the device driver is supposedly interacting with the actual hardware, it should probably be part of the kernel because remember the operating system in the kernel's job is to abstract the user programs from the underlying hardware. And in fact, if this was a driver that was not a part of the kernel, then we might actually have some problems when it came to things like security uh, or abstraction. So maybe we need to update something in the firmware or we need to update something in the device driver and that may mess up. Um, our software that we have installed. So for the most part, device drivers or drivers are a part of the kernel and they're a part of what's known as the loadable kernel modules. So this is something that you can do in a GNU Linux environment and you can do, you can do it in Windows. I don't know how to do it in Mac OS because Mac OS is kind of strange, but I'm going to assume it's somewhat similar to Linux. So in Windows, if you want to have a loadable kernel module, is you want to have a piece of code that is optionally loaded in kernel privilege, you used to put it in the system32 folder. And any DLL that was in that folder was a loadable kernel module, which means when you referred to that piece of code, it would be loaded with kernel privilege. And you can do the same kind of thing in Linux. And in Linux, you use this lovely command called modprobe. So I actually had it open here in my, um, my Chrome. I don't know if I still have it open. But let's see if I do. Uh, do, 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 do. Here it is. So if you want to, so these are some um, Linux kernel commands or GNU Linux commands. So you've got LS mod and LS mod is actually going to show you a bunch of kernel modules. Now, I don't think this will work in doesn't work in Apple, that's not a surprise. They're doing their, their um, loadable kernel modules differently. So if you were on a GNU Linux system, you should be able to type LSmod, and LSmod is actually going to tell you about 
the kernel mod loadable kernel modules that you have and then if you wanted to um, unload a kernel module like let's say you were working on a new nvidia driver so you want to test your new implementation so you need to unload the existing one and then you are going to so you've got to see this rm to kill that is remove it from the kernel so you're unloading it and then to reload it you use mod probe to restart it so if you have any kernel modules that aren't behaving well in linux and i've been, i've had to do this a billion times you have to unload it and then reload it so and that is how you actually load kernel modules now interesting story so the majority of device drivers are going to be part of a loadable kernel module whether that's in windows or linux or mac os the majority of device drivers are loadable kernel modules but not all of them there are some devices that don't need to be a part their drivers don't need to be a part of the kernel so when i was working on printer drivers for 9 and 24 pin printers our drivers were a hundred percent user programs and here's the thing the reason why this works out is because my printer was attached via the serial port and in a, a linux based system so new linux you can access the serial port via a file which we'll talk more about when we talk about file systems but the idea is, is dev TTY zero was my serial port. And if I wanted to, and my printer was plugged into that serial port and I wanted to send data over the serial port, then I just had to write a file to that destination, dev TTY zero. So then the, that was already a part of the kernel and it had nothing to do with the printer. That's just how to send data over a serial port as a file which by the way uh, the Linux kernel does treat a lot of um, things like serial ports and USB and devices as files which has some really cool side effects so the actual act of writing the device registers for the printer I didn't actually do it in any traditional sense the printer and most printers speak their own assembly language now some really expensive printers speak postscript and all you have to do is send write a postscript file to dev tty0 and the printer would receive that data and it would be able to interpret the postscript and do what it needed to do those printers are pretty expensive though so for all the other kinds of printers the printers have their own assembly language their own kind of binary format so all you have to do is take the print job and translate it to the printer's assembly and then write that file to the port. You don't need to be a kernel module to do that because essentially I'm just a glorified assembler. That was kind of a neat thing. So yes, the majority of device drivers are going to be a part of your kernel as a loadable module, but it is not a strict requirement. There are some kinds of devices where we don't need them to be in the kernel and in linux uh some printer drivers fall into that category not all of them but fun stuff okay so we're going to make the assumption however that our kernel our drivers are part of the kernel so then let's take a closer look at this particular driver here you'll notice that we repeatedly pull the right IRQ register while we wait for the device to be completed. But we also know that the device is going to fire an interrupt when it's completed. So why are we polling? Well, we can simplify this particular driver by taking advantage of the fact that we know this device is capable of firing an interrupt when it's done. So we can split it into two parts. You've got the device driver right handler, which is going to initiate communication with the device. So it P's the semaphore to make sure that we are the only one trying to write to the device. And then we write our characters to the data and command register. And then we're done. 
we can go back to executing code or we can block and let another thread run. There's a hundred different things that we can do. And then the second part is the interrupt handler. And the interrupt handler is only going to run when the, inter when the device has fired an interrupt. And then we will go through, uh, so the trap frame will execute, we'll execute MIPS trap, MIPS trap will be like, oh, look, this is a hardware interrupt. So it will run main bus. And then it will then say, oh yes, I see. This was the serial console fired an interrupt. And then it will call the serial consoles handler. And it will realize in there that this was the right. We'll check and say, oh yes, a write has completed. So we will acknowledge completion. And then we can release the semaphore. So this prevents polling. So you might be sitting there like, okay, so every device must do this. No. One of the interesting things about talking about devices is that there's more than one way to do it. And not every device is capable of all of these different things. So for example, um, a lot of devices like the serial console and your clock operate on an interrupt driven system. So when they are done their task, they will fire an interrupt. But USB devices don't operate on that system. So my understanding of USB systems is the actual, they actually use polling to determine when is this done. So when is this device actually done? So they're actually going to poll. And my understanding for the reason for this is if they make the interrupt be fired on the existing USB lines, it could corrupt data going over the USB lines, the existing data line for the USB device. And they could have added a separate line just to handle the interrupts, but it would have changed the specifications of the USB. Like they'd actually have to add an extra wire or something to make that work. And they didn't want to do that. So USB devices use polling instead of interrupts. Now does <laughs> that probably seems like that's a lot of work because we use so many USB devices like this mic I have, this is a USB device. My webcam is a USB device. My mouse is both using Bluetooth and USB. So lots and lots of devices on your computer use USB. There is something called a USB controller in your computer. And I, again, I'm in CS. I am not a hardware engineer, but I believe that um, the USB controller can fire interrupts on behalf of the USB devices, but I don't think that it will not be. Anyways, fun story. Not every device that is interrupts, some devices actually do do polling. So you've got both of these systems actually running. Now, how do you actually communicate with the device register itself? Um, like, is it a special named register? Because if it's a special named register, then the CPU would have to know. No. So this is where things get really interesting. We are only going to cover this at the most high level um, so that you understand that there are lots of different ways that you can communicate within your system. So how do we access these device registers? They are not specially named things. Um, there's no special CPU instruction for interacting with the NVIDIA GPU. That's, that's not how it works. We have instead these mappings. So there's different ways that we can map device registers to locations in memory of our own computer. And then what happens is the device is going to listen on the bus for addresses that it's mapped its own device registers to in the main computer. And when it sees those addresses, it'll be like, oh, I see you're writing to address. A, B, C, D, E, 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 and it will be, that is a device address. That's for me. Okay, so there's different ways of doing this. So the first way is called port mapped IO, and it's one of the older techniques. And the idea is we're actually, this does use special IO instructions to actually read and write from the ports. But what are these ports? So what we have is a separate memory. 
a separate address space that usually uses fewer bits to index it. And in order to access this special memory, this special address space, we have special instructions to read and write from these ports. We're going to call them ports instead of addresses. So just think of it as another chunk of memory that's smaller, uses fewer addresses, and we have special assembly instructions to read and write from this special memory. What's going to happen is each device that uses port mapped I.O. is going to map it each of its device registers to a port or maybe to two ports. So our clock might map um, its speaker command register to port 17. And then what's going to happen is anytime we uh, issue one of these special IO instructions in or out to read or write to one of these ports, that is going to cause us to either write data to the port or read data from the port. And when we are interacting with those port addresses, the device is listening to those lines that connect it to the ports. And if the device sees an address that belongs to one of its device registers go over that little bus, the device is like, that's for me. And it will grab it. And it will see whether it's a read or a write. So it will know, oh, yes, you're trying to read from at port 17. Well, that must mean that you want the status of my speaker. Or you're trying to write to port 17. Oh, that's for me. You must be trying to write to my speaker register. And the device will grab that data for itself. Now, what, how does it listen? When you have a bus, remember I said anything you put on the bus gets received by everything on the bus. So you put an address on the bus and all of the devices see it. So the devices have to know which addresses to listen to. This means that they have to decode the addresses too. That's, we'll talk about that in a minute. So we're going to use special instructions to make port mapped IO work and we have this separate address space. Advantage, it's fast. It's actually really, really fast. The reason why it's fast is because if you look at the amount of addresses that are being transmitted over this particular bus. It's not that many compared to the main bus. And furthermore, because all of the addresses are device addresses, the chances that one of those are for you is much higher. So it is much, much faster than the other techniques. However, the downside is it's very restrictive because there's only so many ports. And so only so many devices can actually be supported by port map dial. So it's very restrictive as to how many devices you can support and how many device registers each device can actually have. So that's port mapped IO in a very rough nutshell. Again, you don't have to know the deep underlying hardware here. This isn't CS450. So then we have another option called memory mapped IO. And this is actually what OS161 does. And uh, it's what it's a very much more modern idea. Memory mapped I.O. is instead of having a separate address space to actually handle the device registers, we are actually going to just use RAM. So we don't need special instructions, which are very restrictive, because we're just going to use a chunk of RAM set aside to map our device registers to. So that means we can just use LW and SW as we would normally to interact with it. So there's nothing special. And we don't need any special bus because we're just going to use the main bus that connects the CPU to RAM. And we're going to make sure that the devices are also connected to that main bus, usually through a bridge. And then what's going to happen is the devices are going to be listening for reads and writes to addresses that correspond to their device brackets. Now, this is a lot more flexible because we can have many more devices supported and those devices can have large registers and they can have as many registers as they want really you like it's a it's much more flexible in how many devices that you have however it's a lot slower and the reason why this is slower than port mapped io is because you now have every device seeing every address going over the main bus and since every single instruction that's executed has at least one address <laughs> request. 
you can imagine your devices are going to have to be seeing, ev they're going to be seeing every address. And so they've got to translate every address or decode every address to determine is it for me or not. So it's slower, but it's much more flexible. Now you might be asking, well, my computer in front of me, is it using port map I/O or memory map I/O? It uses both. This isn't a one or the other situation. Just like the device drivers, we don't just use polling or just use interrupt. Some devices use polling, some devices use interrupts. Same is true for accessing our device drivers. Some devices will use port mapped IO, some will use memory mapped IO. Okay. So the question on Twitch is how would the devices listen to reads and writes, pollings, interrupts? So the devices are firing the interrupts, so they're not listening for interrupts. Um, and the devices are also not doing the polling. That is the kernel that is listening for interrupts, and it is the kernel that is doing the polling. Um, how the devices listen to reads and writes is the device is connected to the address bus, so the device sees, it receives every single address, and it knows which addresses it's supposed to be listening to. And this can be set up through the BIOS and various other things, or it might be a hard-coded thing. And then the idea is that the device is going to throw out or ignore any address that's not for it. And when it sees an address, and it will know whether it's a read or a write based on the information that goes over the address line, um, if it sees an address that is a read that belongs to itself, it will know to read from that address and put the data back on the bus. And if it sees a write and an address, it will get the value and then grab it and put it on itself. Again, that's very much hardware-y stuff, so don't worry too much about that. I mean, if you want to learn more about it, by all means, I can suggest um, some books for that. But um, I'm not going to ask you any deep questions about that. So we have port mapped IO and we have memory mapped IO. But now we can actually go back in time and talk about something. Remember how we had in our address space or our, our virtual memory for OS 161, there was KSEG 0, KSEG 1, and KSEG 2. And we know KSEG 2 was unavailable to us, but KSEG 1 was available. What was KSEG 1? We said KSEG1 was used for talking to devices. And now I can go back and show you how it's used. So KSEG1, which is the very last little chunk of that 512 megabytes of physical memory, we are going to actually use for our memory mapped IO. So KSEG1, we are, all, we are going to set aside 32 slots at the very end of KSEG1. And each of those slots is going to be 64 kilobytes. And those 32 slots are used for mapping device registers. So the only part of KSEG1 we are actually using would be these addresses here plus the offset for KSEG1. So because we have set this region aside to use for device mappings, we in the kernel of the operating system will not use these addresses. They will be set aside. Okay. So then, we've got these slots and each device can be assigned to a slot, but how do you know where your device register is in each of those slots? Well, if we go back, it's right in the spec. The offset in the specification is indicating where in the slot we are mapping that device register to and how big that mapping is. So all of the information we need for how the layout of the slot should look like is all in the specification. Now, are these our only two options for transmitting data to and from devices? No. Because if I wanted to do some really large data transfers, let's suppose I want to transfer uh, four megabytes of data to my disk. Do I have a four megabyte data register? And how is that going to work? 
So to do large data transfers, we have um, two other strategies that we can do. We have one called program controlled IO. Program controlled IO is, I mean, this is something where your CPU is actively going to be putting the data for it to be transmitted to the device or onto the ad onto the bus. So the CPU is actually going to perform. Okay, take the mem take the data and put the data on the address line so the device can grab it. The problem with having with program controlled I/O is that because the CPU actually performs the data transfer, the CPU actually puts the data on the line for the device to grab, is while the CPU is copying all that data onto the address line, it's busy. Which means it's not doing anything else. So if I'm trying to transfer four gigabytes, that's gonna be a lot of time the CPU isn't doing something else. Now, OS 161 actually does do program controlled I.O. because it's a very simple old system. But these days, it would be really nice if we had a mechanism by which we can do large data transfers where the CPU didn't have to do that work. And that is what direct memory access is. So we have this thing called DMA, direct memory access. And the idea is the CPU is going to initiate communication with the device to say, hey device, I need you to read four gigabytes of data from this address. It's for you. <clears throat> it's for, for your, uh, I want you to write it to your disk. And the device is gonna say, thanks CPU, I'll go talk to memory and get that data right away. And so the disk is then going to, after being told what to do from the CPU, the disk can directly access memory and grab the data itself and pull it over to itself. And then when it's done, the disk will fire an interrupt to tell the CPU, I got the data, I'm all done. This is direct memory access. The device is going to be responsible for performing the transfer instead of the CPU. Now, this is a really inaccurate depiction of what DMA actually is. DMA is in itself a separate controller. So there is actually a DMA device and the DMA device is what is going to be doing this work and, and, and helping the disk grab the data from memory. But this is kind of the rough idea is through DMA, the disk can now get the data directly, the large block of data from memory instead of the CPU having to do all the work of putting that onto the address line for the disk. So the question is, so does that mean devices can circumvent the kernel user split in memory? That comes down to an architectural decision. So keep in mind that the device itself isn't really going to be aware of things like the split between the kernel memory and the, the user memory but we're probably not going to be permitting any of these instructions to initiate DMA to be executed unless the, the CPU is in kernel privilege mode. So the kernel and the CPU do have ways of making sure that the de external devices aren't doing bad things, but again, it comes down to an architectural implementation and there are certainly devices that I've seen that can do very bad things. So for example, something like a key logger can steal your keystrokes and steal your passwords. So there's, there are, it, that's a tricky question. <laughs> All right. Now again, our computers aren't doing one or the other. We have all of these things. So we have port mapped IO, we have memory mapped IO, we have program controlled IO, and we have DMA. So all of these are different abilities that we have to communicate with those device drivers. All right, so I'm actually going to leave that here for today uh, because I don't wanna start the next topic uh, right now. But in our next episode, 
we are going to talk about persistent storage. So we're going to talk about how hard drives work and then we're going to look at how to write a device driver for a hard drive and then we're going to also talk about maybe SSDs and we're going to do some math and some scheduling and some other fun things with devices as well. So we will see you on Thursday where we will talk about storage. Hello, I'm a Mac. And I'm a PC, and here at PC Innovations Lab... Wait, wait, PC hmm? Innovations Lab? Well, you know how you have your patented MagSafe cord that pops out anytime someone trips over it? Sure, sure. Well, we're protecting PCs with this new air-cushioned enclosure. It's bubble wrap. And you know how you have your revolutionary new battery that lasts almost an entire workday? Mm. Well, we are offering this new extremely long cord. PC, shouldn't innovations make people's lives easier? Well, that's exactly why we've developed these. Cheers to innovation.